Major funding for this program has been provided by the following. Coca-Cola and our local bottlers have sponsored more than 4,000 scholars like Matthew Turner, helping them to attend college and prepare for careers that benefit all of us. Satisfying a thirst for achievement, the Coca-Cola Company. Additional funding for this program was provided by the United Nations Foundation, promoting partnerships to create a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world. And by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And I'll give the floor to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Sometimes people ask me, Mr. Secretary General, do you have power? I do not have any armies, nor any major resources at my disposal. But I have a bully pulpit. I try to speak for the weak. I'm very happy to come and see you this morning. The poor and the voiceless. I try to encourage governments and urge them to act on their behalf. Hello. Colin, how are you? This is a shoestring operation. I mean, you're improvising the entire time. I think uh, banning those two organizations was a, a real uh, uh, effort. And I think Kofi was used to that because he'd been improvising for years. He sort of brushed away the cobwebs and got out of the attic. I mean, he's established himself as a world figure. <laughs> I ask all here to join me in a toast to the Secretary General of our United Nations. The effectiveness of the United Nations depends on the political will of the member states. The Secretary General is not king of the world. He's Secretary General of a sluggish bureaucracy with amorphous, ill-defined powers. I often hear people say, why isn't the Secretary General taking action? Why isn't he leading the charge on this? Why doesn't the Secretary General strike out and do this and that and that? Oh, it would be very easy to do it. I'd probably get a great emotional satisfaction, but it is not going to be very effective because the only means you have is persuasion. The strength of the United Nations does not lie in hard or raw power. Its influence is fundamentally a moral one. I think the expectations of the United Nations are always enormous. People hope that Kofi Annan is going to be the white knight charging to help people everywhere. But his job is to try and bring into fruition the ideals of the United Nations, despite the backsliding of government. We meet nearly seven weeks later than we had intended 
and we all know why. No words can express our revulsion and sorrow at the senseless loss of life on 11 September. The United Nations is indeed the indispensable common house of the entire human family. When a family is under attack, it is in their common house that its members gather to decide what to do. That atrocious attack sent a very powerful message across the world that we are in this together. It could have been anywhere. I hope we can sustain this newfound unity and this realization that we are dealing with problems that no one country can tackle alone. At the gates of Kabul, news of a Taliban collapse had already reached these thousands. We're standing in the outskirts of the Afghan capital. It seems the Taliban have completely abandoned this city and moved their forces further south. Now, there, there was talk of pockets of resistance, yeah. but yeah. That, that's now passed? No, there are pockets of resistance. I asked Mary to get a tape from my machine. Yeah. The machine is on her desk. She's still looking for a blank tape. And if you could bring it down, then. and the Brits have gone into the Kabul airport. Yeah. Uh, Turkey says that they expect to have their special forces in Kabul by the middle of next week. They give numbers? Uh, no. The Taliban seem to have withdrawn, and they seem to be in retreat on all fronts. Kabul may have fallen, Mazai Sharif may have fallen, but what is the security situation? It may be calm today, would it be calm tomorrow? To the tribal areas southwest of Peshawar. Peshawar. That's the, those are the areas that no one really controls. It's just town, yeah. That nobody, yeah. That, and, and they think he's fled already. That's what they say. And then uh, the king today said that uh, he's concerned that the Northern Alliance is not prepared to participate in. I'm asking the coalition to put pressure on them to join us. I hope the situation will settle. We have to get in enough food to be able to feed everybody that is in need. We are talking about 7.5 million people. In Regent Station, Yeah, just, just bring it in. All right. I'll go and take my papers off. And so if we don't get food in, we're going to have a serious humanitarian situation on our hands. Afghanistan has experienced war now for over 20 years, and it's very difficult to repair the fabric of a society that has been at war. But when the job had to be done uh, to try and rebuild Afghanistan, again as a nation state, there was no other organization available in the world which could do the job. None. I think we're going to review the situation in Afghanistan this morning. Our colleagues uh, from across the Atlantic are settling in. How are you in Addis? Very good, I'm fine, thank you. Catherine, maybe I should ask you and then Ruth to tell us how your operations are going on the ground. We've been able to get 2,000 and 2,400 tons of food in each day, and our logistics people are optimistic that they will even increase this level. Um, and they think that they can get to the 60,000 ton um, range. We'll see. I mean, I, 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 the, the pro bigger problem, though, is we're desperate to buy more trucks, and that's absolutely critical. Okay. For us, it's going to be a tough challenge. Would anyone hmm. else want to comment? A uh, very difficult operation, and uh, this is the story of the UN. We never start it, but we often have to finish it and clean it up. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, places please. Here we go. Five, four, three, two. No, 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 I believe it's my turn. No, Kelly, I think it's my turn. What about me? I'd like to try. Oh, this is Elmo's turn. No, no, Elmo, it's my turn.
turn. No, 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 please, everybody, please, listen to me. It's really it's my turn. It is my turn. Excuse me. What? Hello. Is there a problem I can help you with? Well, that depends. Who are you? My name is Kofi Annan. I'm the Secretary General of the United Nations. Oh. <laughs> what is the problem? No, Emma wants to sing the, the, the alphabet, Mr. Annan. Yeah, but he always sings the alphabet. I no, want to no, sing no, the no, alphabet. You sing it last time, Zoe. Wait a minute. You have no problem. No. No. Why don't we sing it all together? Let's sing the alphabet all together. Together? <laughs> That's so crazy, it might just work. Let's try it. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Hey, we're what pushing my head problem here. here. This is during the song, right? And I've won on Mr. Anand for H, I, J, K. So I'm now looking on camera three for the AMs on the left side here. Take three. Places, please. Why don't we solve this problem the United Nations way, together? And clear! It's fabulous. Performance is great. <laughs> Mr. Renan has graciously agreed to answer a few questions here. Enough to questions. Elmo, what do you think are the biggest problems in the world now, and how do you think the Secretary General can help solve those problems? The Secretary General can go around and give love. Isn't that right? I think love solves lots of problems. A lot of problems. And when we do things together, and we like each other. And respect each other. It's very important. And understand each other. Yes. <laughs> You're smart, you know. Well, Elmo's OK. You want to come and work with me at the United Nations and make peace? Oh, Elmo would love to. What would Elmo do? <laughs> <laughs> I think I would take you on some of the peace negotiations. I would, when people are fighting, well, I would can, tell can, you to make peace, get them to make peace. Can Emma wear a tie like that? Well, yeah, it will help. <laughs> <laughs> are you a big believer in hugs? <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of moments when hugs help a lot, you know. When you're out of ways and you don't know what to do and you want to reach out to somebody, a hug is the big, biggest thing you can give them. The secretary needs to catch a flight, Elmo. Really? Would you like to go along? Yes! Yes! <laughs> Take Elmo with you! Now, Elmo loves being on Sesame Street, but you come back and visit, okay? I will come and visit. Thank mm. you very much. And remember what I've been telling you all day? Yeah. All the things I've taught you, you remember? Yeah. And you share with your other friends? Of course. Say hello to them for me. Mm? Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Welcome to thank you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, hey, how, how are, are you, sir? Good to see you again. Hello, how are you? The Secretary General is the executive of an association of 189 countries. Kofi has a problem because he has to work with the United States. That's quite difficult. This is not only the home of the United Nations, but it is infinitely the richest, most important, most powerful member. So it's the right here, sir. The UN cannot move without the Americans. Unless the Americans are interested in an issue and prepared to get involved and to put some diplomatic weight behind the UN, um, it's, you know, uh, 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 Kofi Annan's hands are tied. It is not easy to coax a great power to do things that it initially doesn't want to do. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, personal chemistry. Kofi Annan has been gently able to persuade the United States uh, to do things that in the past it, it would not do. While we are a very powerful country, there are many, many, many issues where we really have to deal with the rest of the world on a collaborative basis. While we don't necessarily have to deal with all of those issues through the United Nations, the United Nations uh, can be and has been and continues to prove to be 
a very useful vehicle to pursue some very important interests of the United States. These have been difficult and challenging days for my nation. And I benefited from your wisdom and your vision and your resolve and your optimism. Mr. Secretary General, to the continued success of your stewardship of the United Nations. Most governments know very well that there are some problems where they have to get together with everybody else, otherwise nothing's going to happen. There should be a perfectly reasonable balance between national interest and the general interest. The trick in the United Nations is to try to get governments to relax sufficiently about their own sovereignty to allow the organization to do something useful. That's quite difficult. It's been a tough week, and I think it's going to be that way for a while. So there'll be, if I get it right, there'll be two themes, humanitarian and reconstruction. I cannot focus only on terrorism in Afghanistan. I have a, a 15, 20 other crises uh, that I'm dealing with. We have quite a few issues to talk about, and I hope my colleagues here would also chip in, since I'm fighting a cold. And there's a wrong time to get a call, but I hope I will be able to shake it. I, I must say, I'm sometimes very surprised how he looks so cheerful and relaxed. I mean, if you walk into his office, uh, it's you feel like you're entering a Zen Buddhist uh, monastery, you know. Everything looks very calm. Uh, his desk looks clean. And I know how real the pressures are on him. They are incredible. And I also know that I'm sure on a daily basis he gets some very hard and tough messages given to him by very powerful governments. And he takes it in stride. And uh, I, as far as I know, Buddhism never reached Ghana, but uh, the Buddhist spirit has entered Kofi Annan. <laughs> you know who Kofi Annan is? Yes. yes. This is one of my favorite photographs of him because he has this big, big smile. He comes from Ghana. You know where Ghana is? Yeah. Yes. Where is it? In Ghana, a boy born on a Friday is called Kofi. That's why he was called Kofi. I show you this slide from Timbuktu. They gave my husband this big turban. And you see it's so big because they wanted to show how many problems he has. And they gave me the white and brown cloth to show that people of all colors should live together in peace. So next one. And I come from Sweden. I used to paint in Brooklyn. I had my studio in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. And out of the window, what did I see? I saw the United Nations. You see, it's saying UN 50 years old. That was some time ago, because the UN came about out of the Second World War, when the leaders of the world came together and said they never wanted another war. And from the beginning, it was only 51 nations, and now there's 189. And this year, probably two new nations will join, Switzerland and East Timor. It's this very special moment when my husband was elected secretary general. And you can imagine how proud I was at that moment. I actually was in a small restaurant on 43rd Street and somewhere 10th or 11th Avenue with a girlfriend of mine when I got to know that he was elected secretary general. And uh, I was elated on, on his behalf, but again, I had to sit down for about 10 minutes before because everything, I felt like I was in the eye of a storm. After nine long days, after nine long nights, the Afghan delegates have signed an agreement on how a future Afghanistan should be ruled for the next two years until there will be a free and fair elections. That's at least what the UN is hoping for. Afghan factions, whatever, uh, today signed an agreement on a transitional, uh, on an interim government. Then in terms of international reaction, Blair calls it a, a truly remarkable achievement. Schroeder says the conclusion of this agreement shows the role the United Nations can and should play. So that's good. All right. Uh, 
oh, and we should put in that sentence, the authority will be headed by Hamid Karzai. Do you have a quote from Brahimi? Well, the quote I have uh, is from DPA, where he says, the tough times have just started. We can, we we can, go, with a, we can go with the optimistic quote. The Taliban uh, collapsed so suddenly and unexpectedly that it meant that the military developments were way ahead of political developments. And of course, that brings with it tremendous pressure on us to act very, very, very quickly. Who is going to be responsible for maintaining security? I think we're going to focus on the Balkans uh, this morning. But given what happened in Bonn uh, last night, I would ask Mr. Prendergast to give us a brief on the discussions in Bonn. Uh, on the surface, everything in uh, Bonn uh, ended uh, neatly uh, with, with smiles and mutual congratulations. Uh, but I understand that um, there were great tensions in the last few hours. Now, I think the thing we have to focus on now is the fact that the handover of power is supposed to be in Kabul on the 22nd of December. Uh, that leaves us uh, not much more than two weeks uh, in order to uh, deal with a large number of quite substantial issues, including the, the question of, uh, of security arrangements for that city. I think we're in a very volatile situation right now. The Taliban were brutal, but the fact is that kept the bad guys off the street. I mean, there was a functioning authority there. The one thing the Taliban did achieve was a, an effective security regime. It was effective in its brutality, but it meant you could drive the roads. What is needed is a force that has the capability to stop the fighting, to impose a minimum degree of security. But that's one of the difficulties of the UN. We don't have a standing army. This is the quandary for the United Nations. They're very often asked to send peacekeeping, lightly armed peacekeeping troops into a war zone where no peace agreement has been signed and there is no peace to keep. And they can't really do that. We should be asked to do things that are doable and not be asked to do things which are impossible. And also that we should be consulted about what is expected of us. Um, I don't, you probably, your viewers don't know anything about rugby, but in rugby, when you throw the ball to somebody who's about to be hit very hard by a whole lot of defenders, it's called a hospital pass. And quite often the UN is given the hospital pass. Rwanda is probably the greatest catastrophe that the United Nations faced. The United Nations had a small, ineffectual peacekeeping mission in Rwanda. The Security Council had not been willing to send an adequately equipped and forceful mission. Uh, it was peacekeeping on the cheap. Kofi Annan was the head of peacekeeping at the time. At the beginning of 1994, the general in charge of the UN mission in Rwanda received information from an informant that um, a massacre was imminent. And he sent a request to New York for uh, permission to try and seize weapons of the, of the killers. And that request was denied. And I think for the United Nations Peacekeeping Department, it was a big mistake. I think that Kofi Annan must have been absolutely horrified by what happened. After the genocide began, he rang about a hundred countries asking them to send more peacekeeping troops. Instead, most of the countries who had troops there already tried to get them out, and no one else wanted to send more. It was a nightmare. It was, it was a nightmare. If we had acted earlier, we could have saved quite a lot of lives. We need to ensure that 
if ever, and God forbid, we are confronted with this sort of situation again, we do not fail. We do not fail to save lives. We do not fail to act. You know, it was the world that stood by, not just the United Nations that stood by. It was the world and all the, its interested countries, the uh, most important countries in the world, the United States, the European countries, and many African countries also, that just didn't want to get involved. I do think that everybody has a great deal to answer for there, including Kofi's department. This was terrible, and, and nobody comes out well out of this. If you're a participant in any catastrophe that, in hindsight, you believe you might have done something to stop, of course it changes you. Kofi had this remarkable report written, which is a terrific uh, indictment of everybody, including him. Kofi Annan said, I accept these criticisms fully, and he's been absolutely upfront in accepting responsibility for things that the United Nations failed to do. He could have ducked for cover. He could have said, it's not my responsibility, it's not my fault. But he refused to do that. The genocide of Rwanda will define for our generation the consequences of inaction in the face of mass murder, massive and systematic violations of human rights. Wherever they may take place should not be allowed to stand. In 1999, he said, what happens if you have something like a Rwandan genocide? This organization is based on the sovereignty of states. What is the balance between national sovereignty, on which this organization is constructed, and a sort of universal responsibility when something terrible happens to a large number of people? If states bent on criminal behavior know that frontiers are not the absolute defense, if they know that the Security Council will take action to halt crimes against humanity, then they will not embark on such course of action in expectation of sovereign impunity. Kofi Annan has developed the doctrine of humanitarian intervention, which says that sovereignty must be limited and the world has the right to intervene quickly and forcefully to stop mass violations of human rights, such as in, in Rwanda. Evil does exist in the world, and you have to deal with evil. What steps can we take to make sure the kind of tragedy we saw in Rwanda never happens again. And if it were to happen tomorrow, would the international community be there? And quite honestly, I don't know. Let me run you by what we know. Yeah, yeah. Huh? exactly. Morning, he's more or less on his own. He can do what he wants, obviously. The entourage of the Secretary General, those that are sitting in this room, will use the little car. Mm -hmm. I have the only one question on this. I'm not sure that the ESG would like to have, you know, everybody following him. Fine, to those then let's, let's absolutely discuss it now. Yeah. He has almost an obsession about and outnumbering he's very, the yeah, other side. He's very yeah. sensitive to this, so okay. we so, continue. He will be taken up to the, to the press conference room from there, after the press conference. Then we have the synagogue thing, which has been added, right? Before that, you remember we are tagging on the no, Amnesty we're going, International No, the thing. Amnesty is before Other he words. goes to dinner. OK. Yeah. OK. There, from there, he may come back here to the hotel before going to the joint audience. The joint audience, yes. just the principals there. And you remember the issue also came up on whether or not a note taker would go. 
I don't Absolutely. think anyone can go That's to that thing. Right. I think this is so yeah. private that maybe even the SG won't go. <laughs> <laughs> Should we bring the book uh, in the book in the, the car? He is an outstanding diplomat. He's been able to walk a tight rope elegantly. <laughs> there are countries that have sometimes not paid their dues, you know, and uh, you have to be careful what you say uh, in case some other people get upset. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I got a bit of rest. I needed it very much. Yes, yeah, certainly. feel at all uneasy accepting the peace prize when there's so many conflicts around the world, especially the bloody one in the Middle East and, and the Afghanistan bombing. You are right that uh, it seems rather odd to be receiving a peace prize at a time when we have so many conflicts in the world. But I think that also ex exemplifies the world we live in. The good and the evil unfortunately live side by side. What is important is that we do not lose hope and we have the courage to keep working to end conflicts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Nice day. Yes, wonderful. Clears the head. Aus Norwegen kommen ja ganz wunderbare Dinge, zum Beispiel die gigantischen Weihnachtsbäume, die Jahr für Jahr den Londoner Trafalgar Square zieren und der Friedensnobelpreis. Everywhere you are, you take this special bracelet with you. It's a gift from your wife or I yeah, don't know. Yeah, we exchange it, yeah. This, this is the one you mean, yeah. It's a key of life. The key of life is something that we both uh, wear and give one to each other. Vous avez l'impression qu'il y a une touche, un style, une efficacité Kofi Annan qu'on récompense aussi. J'essaie de faire des choses de ma façon. Euh, je ne sais pas si c'était un style Kofi Annan, mais c'est la mienne. I'm Alexander from Channel One of Russian TV, and all our Russian TV viewers congratulate you. Oh, yeah. You are a jet setter, a crazy jet setter. How do you manage to, to stay healthy? Um, let me say that I will not use the term jet setter. <laughs> I will say my work takes me all over the world and I try to exercise a bit wherever I am in the mornings when I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Would you would you give me his name? All right. Okay, good. We will let him know. Thank you. A bit of a sad story. What happened? This is a guy who worked years at the UN, <clears throat> worked with the Secretary General mm -hmm. in Africa, then went to Honduras, had a major accident. He's got one leg gone, one eye gone, oh. and he just wants to shake the hands of the Secretary General. I said, no, <laughs> you can't. Anyway, he'll wait for him at the, will you be with us at the Foreign Office? Yes. Okay. So if I hope I won't forget. Why would you say no to that? I said yes. I'm cruel, but I'm not that cruel.
There is a problem in this world. Nobody can tell us what's happened to our children. There's no rules for what I can expect from this world. And you, Mr. Kofiara, you must use your influence to make sure that this problem will solve. Please return our son back. We're fathers and mothers. I want to tell you, Mr. Kofiara, please do your job and make a new law in this world. And thank you very much. They wanted to tell you that they trust you to try and help them. I think this is a very human and natural thing that you, you, you need. I talk to the leaders in the region. We go there to try and press them to do whatever we can to take you out of this agony. Uh, you need the bodies back to bury them, to be able to mourn and move on. This doesn't bring your boys back. It's not a perfect uh, solution, but at least from personal and humanitarian and emotional point of view, we will do whatever we can to bear, uh, support and help you. So you wanted to say something? <laughs> She says uh, that she congratulates you for getting the Nobel Prize tomorrow, and she she hopes that uh, you can help them, and that this prize will be really, you know, uh, was why for you that you deserve this, the prize for that. That's what she wanted to tell you. Let me say just one last word. Yeah. We know your time is pressed, so we appreciate even more your goodwill to come here. Thank you very much. Say in Jewish tradition, Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov. Good luck. Good luck. I need it. Mazel Tov. I to push for peaceful settlement of the conflict in the Middle East. I have tried to be very fair, speaking out whenever there has been something wrong, regardless of who did it. I think we can all agree that neither side in this conflict has entirely clean hands. Of course, when you say that, you get into trouble. You know, the initials SG, people think it's Secretary General, but there are times when it becomes a scapegoat. Will you be with him in the car? Yes, I will be with yeah. him in the car. Therefore, you are the one who will hold the speech for him. Yeah. And okay. give it to him at that point. Because once he gets out of the car, yeah. we have no access to him anymore in terms of giving him the speech. Oh, I won't because, be able to get near him? No, because he's up on the podium. We discussed it with him. He said he's comfortable with taking the speech himself. Okay. He's agreed to all that. All right. So, I can we put it in something speech. nice? Well, you do what you want. I don't care about that. You but like the that blue? I mean, nice. What do you mean, nice? Yeah, no, I saw it. They had the, when I went to uh, to some of these things, they have it in a nice leather folder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I even see that. Good morning. Congratulations. It's a wonderful day. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was trying to get all of you to walk, but <laughs> protocol says you can't walk. Well, I can walk. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go.
this is an incredible uh, honor for someone who has taken this long journey from Africa. Growing up as a child in Ghana, there was always someone to go and talk to, someone to go and seek advice from. Uncles, cousins, aunts, grandmothers. They used lots of proverbs to teach. I could have walked into my father's office and say, I'm so upset with that boss of mine. I'm going to go to the office tomorrow and tell him off. He will listen, and he probably say, son, sit down, and uh, look at me and, and say something like, son, you don't hit a man on the head if you've got your fingers between his teeth, and that will be it. And I have to walk away and figure it out. Kofi Annan comes from a family of chiefs. In Ghana, the role of chiefs is to end disputes, to build bridge, uh, to listen, and then to judge and provide uh, leadership. I grew up at a time in Ghana where the struggle for independence was going on. And as a teenager, we didn't stop talking politics at school because we were all involved following the struggle for independence, and we saw the whole nation demanding and fighting for freedom and independence, and wanting to take charge of his own destiny. It was electrical. Ghana has a special place in African consciousness. the country that spearheaded the independence movement for Africa. It was very much the center of African imagination. And that was the country in which Kofi Annan grew up. I came to the States in the 60s. lots of struggle about the freedom movement and the black movement here in the States, which was interesting for me because it was more or less a continuation of what I had gone through in Ghana, but in a different form. I started with World Health Organization in Geneva in, in 62. never dreamt about uh, being Secretary General. In fact, for most of my career, it wasn't even a possibility because the member states have always gone outside the organization to look for a Secretary General. I was the first Secretary General to come from within the ranks. When I joined the UN, I thought I will work with the organization for two years and go home. But here I am. wonderful day for me, for all of us, and for the UN. And I really want to thank you for coming. Apparently, the torchlight procession begins now. Uh -huh. where, where, do, where, where do they go? The television, NRK. 
they can look at the television, but if, what, if they, what, if they want to, what if they want to have a feel? Man, they want to, yeah. <laughs> television is there. But, or you go down to the streets. tables in different receptions. I was pocketing them as fast as I they could. They weren't selling them? I only could steal 24 of them. <laughs> the next one is Mexico, sir. Mexico. Vicente, how are you? Good. It is wonderful to hear your voice. I want to call you about Colombia. I've been concerned that the talks may break down. And so I have an envoy who is going between the two parties, the FARC and the government, trying to keep the process alive. Uh, he seems to be making some progress. I talked to President, I spoke to Pastrana this morning, who was encouraged by the work he's doing. But of course, he gave 48 hours uh, deadline, which expires at 9.30 this evening. And uh, I think it would be good if uh, you can also give him a call and encourage him to do whatever he can. Uh, I've had a word with Castro, and Hugo Chavez was here yesterday, and I spoke to him also. And I think if we all bring our collective pressure to bear, we might be able to keep the process alive. Let me say it's not hopeless. It's not hopeless, and that's why uh, whatever we can do uh, will be helpful, yeah. Okay. To be a good mediator, okay. you have to be a good listener. To be able to help people, you have to listen, to understand what their concerns are. Absolutely, yeah. I may walk into a situation and tell the people, if you stop fighting, if you stop doing this or that, I will make sure you get economic assistance, you get financial assistance. That may not be their concern at all. Their concern may be fear. Fear that uh, if something is not done, the other group may eliminate them. Their very existence may be at risk. And um, you need to understand that. OK, good. OK, thank you very much. My best regards to your wife. OK, adios. Y hasta pronto. Bye. Could you explain to the Japanese public why the international community has to give such a huge amount of money for the reconstruction of Afghanistan? I think Afghanistan has demonstrated to us how dangerous it is to allow any country uh, to fail, to become a failed state, to disintegrate. And, um, uh, not have a government. 
That is a kind of situation that attracts terrorists. So to rebuild Afghanistan, I think it's, it's worth the investment. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today in Afghanistan, a window of opportunity is opening. The tumultuous events of recent months have created hope for a new Afghanistan. They have given the Afghan people a chance to rebuild a state, a state that is at peace with itself and its neighbors. Our challenge is to help the Afghan people themselves. An estimated $10 billion will probably be needed for the next five years to meet these challenges. That is the estimated cost of reconstruction, and it is that sum we hope will be pledged at this conference. Funding is a precarious business, and every year it's tightrope walking. The UN doesn't have the resources of its own. We are out there every year rattling the can looking for money. Kofi Annan has the sort of bully pulpit power to demand they do it, but unfortunately not the executive power to ensure they do it. This conference is not about rhetoric. It is about resources and about helping the people in need. And so I will go right to the bottom line. On behalf of the United States, I'm pleased to announce that the American people will give $296 million in this fiscal year to the Afghan people for the reconstruction of their society and their nation. We deliberately struck quickly while the global media spotlights on Afghanistan. There's a huge global political and media focus which we wanted to seize. Rehabilitative care for millions of disabled, you know, the appalling number of wounded from landmines, demining must be high on the agenda. I got three more thoughts for you. Or as best you can. Okay. As with me and him. If you can. Oh well. Mr. Secretary, what, what are your opinions about how the first day in the conference seems to be going in general regarding the donations? No, I, I'm encouraged. I think uh, it's gone very well. We've got a um, decent level of contributions, but we need to analyze the results. Uh, there may be gaps and areas where we didn't do as well. It's a long process, but we've made a good start. So, for better or for worse, this is an effect for the world inter uh, nation building in Afghanistan. Oh, absolutely. Whether we like the phrase or not. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. How long is the uh, ride to the next appointment? A ten oh, minutes. We, uh, we have to leave right on, on the nose yeah. to be there. Okay. At 14 hours, the emperor will come out from that door. The emperor. As soon as you see the emperor, you can start. Yes. Mm. And then, then he will come up mm. here and the doors will go. The secretary general will enter. And so then they, they will shake hands here. Ah, this is a previous photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can take this kind of picture. Are you allowed to film for 90 seconds only upon their seating? And we have to leave. You can only 90 seconds. Okay, you understand that no sound, nothing. No sound. No sound. So He's speaking and nothing. Uh, uh, Oh, do 
もでも国連大統領で入れていただきたいと思います。NHK。NHK サイト。It's no longer it's no longer NHK. It's UN. It's UN. The palace was so a beautiful one, which was in full bloom. You've seen the red one? Yeah. 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 And they only blossom in winter. Isn't that incredible? Apparently, during uh, his free time, he does this on the plane. Oh, so right. I said, and, and brought it to me. And so That's I think um, you can always select whichever Thank ones you, you want. Because I think it is very But I think it is about people. It is about understanding people. It is about trying to find in everybody else's position what is positive in it. And see if you can add up the positive that exists in, in, in everybody else's attitude. But don't diplomats rely on money and military power? The UN doesn't have either of those. Well, I mean, no, but those sort of things enable you to dispense with diplomacy. <laughs> I mean, if you go to someone and say, "Do as I, uh, you know, do as I tell you to do," that's not diplomacy. That, uh, that's force. I think Al Capone said, uh, "You know, there is absolutely nothing wrong with with the negotiation, but it is so much better when you have a gun in your hand." Uh, in terms of uh, Afghanistan, I think that's the most important stop of the trip because uh, we have a, a brand new and fragile administration which uh, faces an enormous series of problems and uh, I think the Secretary General wants to do everything in his power to try to uh, contribute to the stabilization of that regime. I mean, there are some very, very urgent, immediate needs. In Tokyo, many governments were willing to offer quite large amounts of jam tomorrow, or jam in five years' time. But what they need is some jam today to pay the, the civil servants to keep the government running.
بناهن کوشش شو که شخصیت های فنی اشخاص متخصص هر چه عاجل تر برای افغانستان بیاین اما شخصیت های سیاسی فکر میکنم با در نظر داشت اوضاع یک ذره آهسته آهسته بیاین در غیر از او بسیار خطرناک است the technical and professional afghans need to come back should come back to afghanistan to help the political figures who are outside afghanistan should not come very soon because there might be a lot of problems afghanistan ba yak anbar barut memana ki ba yak jirqa yak hariq buzurg va sarbaz we have different cultures different religions different political systems and so you have to be so attentive and so engaged look into the eyes look at their body language and the way they communicate is also different americans are very direct very straightforward other cultures are very subtle you wouldn't hear them say no the word no will not be uttered but you should listen to know when they are saying no you must listen to not only what is being said but what is not said which is often much more important than what they say Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to see today a distinguished personality of the world, somebody who can be called the president of the world. When we were kids, we thought when we were kids, when we, when we were kids, we thought the Secretary General was the, the president of the world, as, as much as he may not like it. But uh, that's a that's a, a position that that has respect of the world community, of the member states. Nobody has and, uh, the credibility in Afghanistan the way the UN does. Despite all these failed peace attempts, despite the famine and the drought, and there was no money and the UN couldn't provide for everyone in every place, the credibility of the UN is sky high. Repeat after me. This woman is a teacher. This woman is a teacher. This man is a tailor. This man is a tailor. This girl is a student. This girl is a student. Ah, look at this. Let's give him another. Come on. Let's give him another. Come on. Use he. By what is this boy? What you mean? Don't you mistake my name? I'm very happy to come and see you this morning where you are all so intent on studying. Are you enjoying being in school again? That's wonderful. Really. Good afternoon. I see every, ev everybody wants peace. It was remarkable to see these young people who were so excited and so enthusiastic to be in school. 
was really so reassuring, but he also realized the needs, the systematic destruction that we saw, disrupted lives of innocent people. And one of the ministers put it very poignantly when he said to me, reconstruction can be done, because I had said, what a job. He said, reconstruction can be done, houses, roads we can build. But the Afghan spirit is broken. How do you put that together? The people of Afghanistan have an unprecedented opportunity to begin anew. The chance must not be missed by Afghans, by their neighbors, or by the international community. After September the 11th, it was said, never again, and we will support Afghanistan, we will rebuild Afghanistan. But although people say we are going to be very generous, promises are much easier to make than actually handing them for cash. Sadly, in the last few months, there hasn't been that much evidence that they are actually going to put their money where their mouth is. There is a peacekeeping force in Kabul itself trying to restore order and security in Kabul. But the US and other Western countries have refused to increase that peacekeeping force so that it can spread around the countryside. And again, the United Nations is stuck in the middle of trying to help rebuild this failed state, but not being given adequate resources. If the international community does not wish to take an advanced role in an area for whatever reason, uh, there's very little you can do. The Secretary General does not have authority unless that authority is backed up with money, personnel, and occasionally force. It was only after 20 years that the UN was able to act in East Timor, but when the opportunity arose, the UN did act and they stopped the war. Less than 12 hours, East Timor will be an independent country. But democracy and development need nurturing. So for us, this is not the end of the road. We are not saying goodbye. We will be around for quite a while. I hope you are not in a hurry to get rid of us. have said that this country would become an independent country. It's a source of joy and pride for us that we help this small country in which no one was interested to become independent and to really stand on its two feet. This has been a long journey, but we are almost there. A very long journey. We're losing a job tonight. We're no longer the head of state of East Timor. <laughs> We believe in this little country, we believe that they deserve to be free of all those years of bloodshed and centuries of oppression, and uh, so we're very happy. It's easy to forget that a lot of things are working well. Mr. Walter, the major Gibson, any next? Amidst all this trouble, 
we have some guideposts to the future that are quite positive. Do you remember when you told me three to six months? Uh, yeah, I said, <laughs> yeah, I said, I said I would remind you. Yeah, no, no, but, <laughs> but uh, it was a long two, uh, three to six months. Absolutely, it was a but long worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. I had a good discussion yeah. with them, and I really stressed that they had a, a, a great opportunity where they can uh, come out gloriously or they can blow it. Yeah, and that exactly. they have the future exactly. of the nation in their eyes and their individual egos sh should not get in the way. The last time I came to East Timor, almost every building in this town was charred. No roofs, uh, burnt up. It was not long after the uh, destruction that was wrought by the Indonesian military before they withdrew. If you can imagine every house set ablaze with kerosene, house by house, street by street, village by village. It was a dark moment. It was a bloodbath of horrible proportions. It was my first week on the job as ambassador, so I remember it quite vividly. And Kofi Annan was very active, decisive, and pushing for action. He knew that if the international community did not intervene, the killings would continue, the destruction would continue, the losses would be horrific. He knew at the same time that no member state was prepared to march into East Timor without the consent of Indonesia. Nobody wanted to fight their way in here against the Indonesians. And so I spent lots of time trying to convince the Indonesian president that they need help that their troops have not been able to do it, and that the international community is not coming in in a confrontation or so, but to, to help to assist and help protect lives on this island. He slept two, three hours a night for a week because of the time differences, talking to the Americans, the Brits, various other countries, the Portuguese, getting countries to be ready to intervene, and he orchestrated the whole thing to a point when the Indonesians finally made a public request to the UN to intervene, and then he pushed through the Security Council an action that got the troops in. It was an international force led by the Australians and the Filipinos and others with American support authorized by the UN but not reporting to the UN. That's probably the best model for the future. The place was left in ruins, physical ruins with all the burnt down buildings and with nobody to run any kind of government and the United Nations has had to create that. When I visited East Timor after its liberation from Indonesia, I saw this massive United Nations machine, hundreds of uh, United Nations civil servants from all over the world living and trying to create a, create a state. At the beginning, into early 2000, many of the roads basically disappeared. And they were built up so that you could actually get the humanitarian supplies out. It worked and extremely it worked. well. It worked very well. We were responsible for everything that a government will normally be responsible for. Power and water. How do you, how do you get the power? power water? Which source do you use for the power? Well, this is <clears throat> partly restoring the Kamora power station, the price supplies daily. And then we, we ensured that the clinics and hospitals were being run, that the schools were open. Providing materials through the School in a Box program, which has yeah. actually worked very good for places like Afghanistan. So you can send pencils, books, rulers, crayons, slates, uh, materials for the teachers. We should see our role as builders, that when you're building a house, you put the scaffolding around it, and you continue your construction. And when the construction is gone, you peel off and would remove the scaffolding, but the building stands. And that is the role the UN would want to uh, see here, the role we've given ourselves. 
We are beginning to remove the scaffolding, but the building and the edifice that we've all constructed with the East Timorese must stand the test of time. So you will be sitting in your seat at the beginning. You get up by yourself, you go to the lectern, you read your speech. You will stand alone on one side, there'll be an ex saying Secretary General facing the audience. And on the other side, the two others, Guzmao and Lula, will stand. Okay. If you kiss them, if you hug them, it would be good. Yeah. Because remember that the entire focus is on that stage. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of your speech is when right. you do the official transfer to the government of power. I ask you all now to rise for the official transfer of executive authority. This is the big solemn moment. Yeah. Everybody rises, you wait till everybody rises. And you will say, by the authority vested in me by the Constituent Assembly of East Timor, I hereby declare East Timor an independent democratic republic dedicated to the rule of law and the rights of man. And then they will raise the flag. You have no role sure. at this point. But of course, there'll be jubilation around you, you will shake hands, you will do something, yes. spontaneous, whatever it is. Then when do we have to leave here? We have to leave here in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. You need to find one of the Timorese ladies to go and practice the Tetum with the SG. He's looking for one of the Timorese ladies to do the pronunciation. Mario. OK, well, why don't you now tell me where the breaks are for the, for the Tetum translation? Wait, uh, Nadia. Nadia. One second. Where is the interpreter? The SG asked for one of the Timorese ladies. No, but, but they, they are not okay. capable of doing it. Where is the interpreter? Mario, where is the interpreter? There's one couple of words you want to say. Is it quite a panic? He's in Tazitolo. All right, so I'll have to use the guy here. And we'll just have to improvise. Come, don't worry. Come oh, on. Try, try. Come, 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 don't worry. Try, Joe, do your best. He doesn't speak English. If you speak Tetan, you yes. listen to him in Tetan and say if he says it right. Just listen to him. Parabens, boasoti, e obrigado, barak. See? Viva Timor Lest. It's good? good yeah. oh. I think he got the last one. <laughs> I think he got the last one. He got it very well. <laughs> Mai Bainakasira, halo favor, po bimbindu bas sekretaris jeneral Masui Sunides Nian, Senior Kofi Anam. This will not be a long speech. It cannot be. For in just a few minutes, I must stop as we reach midnight on 19 May. With the start of 20 May, you will step into a new era in your history as an independent nation. I have no doubt that you will fulfill your new roles as citizens of East Timor and of the world with spirit and great success. I wish you a bright and secure future. Parabench, Boasot, e obrigado, Barak. Viva, viva, viva Timor Leste.
I would never have thought that in my lifetime I would go through two independent ceremonies. The first one was the independence of my own country, Ghana. I was a teenager then. It was an exhilarating moment and an incredible period for a young man growing up. I grew up really thinking change is indeed possible. All is possible. And here am I, over 40 years later, in East Timor. But this time, on the other side, I'm the one handing over the independence to the East Timorese. I don't think you can survive a Secretary General unless you actually believe that eventually the UN is going to work far better than it now works, and that long after we're all gone, there will be a world of law, will be a world of order, will be a world where governments, in fact, work far more as a community than they do now. There was a time in East Timor when it seemed all lost, and uh, everybody was sad, accusing everybody, why did we do the elections, how did we get them into this and all that. I could have given up hope then, and uh, all of us could have. When you see the happiness in their faces and the energy, it gives you encouragement. I understand what they are feeling, I understand what it means to fight for self-determination, I understand the excitement, the expectation, but of course it is not going to be easy. Once you've achieved this great thing called independence, which the whole nation fights for, then the hard task begins. Sometimes I suggest we do things. And they said, but Mr. Secretary, this is a dream. You're a dreamer. I said, I'm not afraid to dream. You, you first have to start with a dream. Build your castles in the air and give it foundation. Without dream, you're not going to get anywhere. Kofi Annan, Center of the Storm, continues on PBS Online. Learn about the Secretary General's role, how the UN is organized, and test your knowledge. You can do it all at pbs.org.
Major funding for this program has been provided by the following. Partnering with the nation's largest literacy organization and your local bottler, we're putting more than a million new books in the hands of children who need them most. Satisfying a thirst for a brighter future. The Coca-Cola Company. Additional funding for this program was provided by the United Nations Foundation, promoting partnerships to create a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world. And by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation.